one of the things because we often do our job very well and nobody knows what we do people think our job is simpler than it is and it is incredibly complex it's sort of i often say that we're sort of a bit like ninja cinderellas you know we're just sort of come in and fix everything invisibly and do all the work and then then dive out <laughs> again and it's it, and i would love to say that we can train everyone who's coming through and give them that knowledge so that they don't jump up too early but we've been so busy over here that people are stepping up um before and they're learning on the job which you know was how i learnt and you know there was no formal training sure. but i know that my location babies as they are known um you know they do stay alming for longer than i think people who haven't necessarily been through the course probably because they realize how complex it is Locations, go to two. Harriet, go ahead. I'm Harriet Lawrence. I'm a supervising location manager based in London and shooting throughout the UK. This is Locations on Two. This is Dodd Vickers, your host for Locations on Two, the podcast that takes you around the world and behind the scenes of productions working in all aspects of the entertainment industry. You can find me online at doddvickers.com. Locations on Two is brought to you by the Location Managers Guild International. The LMGI is a global organization of location professionals working in film, television, and the commercial industry. Find out more by visiting them online at locationmanagers.org. On this episode of the podcast, I'm joined by UK-based location manager Harriet Lawrence. Originally trained as a fine art photographer, Harriet stumbled into the location industry and has gone on to establish a training program for up-and-coming location professionals in the UK. With more than 25 years in the industry, Harriet has been asked to collaborate on such projects as Overlord, The Death of Stalin, Suffragette, Seven Days in Entebbe, and The Personal History of David Copperfield. Let's jump on over to the back channel where the real work gets done on set. Locations on two. So as I understand it, you started studying photography uh, with an interest in being a photographer, but but uh, kind of fell into location management. Is that right? You were you were interested in being a photographer? Yeah, I, I mean, I studied photography as, as my degree, but I think it sort of fairly, it became fairly evident fairly quickly that making money as an art photographer is rare. Um, uh, you know, it's a wonderful idea to take beautiful pictures and put them on the wall of a gallery, yeah. but <laughs> right. the reality is not quite like that. And um, I, I sort of fell into uh, location scouting. I just met someone. I, I had a part-time job in retail, actually, and I met someone who was shooting on the street outside the particular shop we were at. And um, I got chatting and found, really by accident, a career that I love. My sister's always said that I'm nosy and bossy. I like I like to call it curious um, and and bossy. Um, <laughs> I think or, uh, I don't even know if I'm organised, but um, it, you know, fairly direct. And I and both sides of the coin just really clicks. And I and I love both bits. I mean, the scouting obviously is wonderful, and we all all love that when you're bringing something creative to to the party, and you can actually really, you know help that creative input and and bring some knowledge and i love talking about architecture i love talking about mud in this particular case where i am at the moment uh, and i you know i love talking about brickwork and knowing sort of different types of brickwork or <laughs> different types of geography or architecture that are sort of in different parts of the country so that really really resonated with me but i actually do love the problem solving and the complexity of sort of putting it together and enabling all the other departments to do their jobs because actually you know as as, as you know the the better we do that the less anyone actually knows what we've done sure <laughs> what part of the uh, country did you grow uh, up in you were you a city girl or a country um, girl or was, where did where I did you grow scotland up scotland until i was 18 um just oh, be, between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and then moved down to London uh, to go to Chelsea School of Art before realising that I couldn't actually draw. So I, my degree was then in photography, and <laughs> then uh, I, you know, 
messed around for a few years trying to work out what I really wanted to do. I did a bit of picture editing uh, just as the, the internet was starting back in the early 90s. I was editing a website on astronomy. And uh, I'm, I'm one of the most inept computer technical people. Oh, really? My partner is sitting at the end of the sofa nodding furiously. Um, and, of course, the internet <laughs> d- didn't really exist to most people. And I found I was having conversations with NASA's picture library. Um, and I knew nothing about astronomy either, but so, yeah, it's one of those sort of little <laughs> things that you fall into. And, and um, it enabled me to start working in the film industry because – that was freelance, and they just wanted a certain number of days uh, a month. And so it did give me some money coming in, which, of course, you know, when you're starting in the industry, especially, you know, over 25 years ago, it was quite hit and miss whether you'd get any work. Uh, I don't know what it's like in, in the States now, but certainly over here mm-hmm. in the UK, you're certainly pre-COVID, and it does seem to be now, you know, there is so much work around. So those sort of junior members of the department who are starting out really have don't have that sort of fear that you know you might only work two days a, a month when you first start you know they they seem to have lots and lots of opportunities so um the mm-hmm. the picture editing helped me have an income um which meant i could pick up work on set and and really discovered that something i loved so you, you were working retail and retail management and they were filming outside of your, your shop you were working in? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was. Sort of, what, what production was it? Do you remember? Oh, it was a commercial. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what it was, but it was a commercial and it was one of those ones. Of oh, sort of okay. Location manager comes in and says, we're, we're closing the road next week. You know, do you have any deliveries or trucks? And I was like, Oh, that sounds interesting. What, do you do? <laughs> what did you say you do? Um, and we got chatting and we stayed in touch and that was, um, really how I fell into it by accident. And you also started in commercials. Yes. Yeah. So you were doing commercials before you made the jump to film and, um, a more grander types of productions, I guess you would say, although commercials have their own complexity to them for sure. They do. And you know, they're, they're great fun. I have to say the sort of towards the end of the nineties, I was getting rather tired of kitchens, suburban kitchens, uh, you know, a lot of commercials. If you think about the, cleaning products and the cereal and the foods there's lots and lots of kitchens <laughs> you know i think if you do the great adverts you know big car adverts or you know some sort of epic ones where you're traveling all over the country finding wonderful locations then you know those are exciting and still challenging but an awful lot of commercials are you know suburban houses so and and once i moved into drama and independent films then you sort of stay there, stay wherever your niche is. So you started in commercials in the early 90s, and then was that through the person that you met that came into the store? Did they help you get in, or did you explore it and manage to get in on your own? Um, I didn't go and work with him at the time, although I did later, but he did introduce me to someone that I then went and assisted. And, you know, back in those days, it was literally a department of two Um Right. And um, yeah, so so he gave me a few contacts and I made made the most of those. And someone very kindly took me out onto set and I literally had no idea what a film set looked like. Uh runner came up to me and said, Do you want a call sheet? And I sort of looked slightly blank and went, I don't know, do I? <laughs> do I? It's a call sheet. I mean, literally, you 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 are thrown in back in those days, you were thrown in in the deep end and you sank or swim, really. Actually, I was thinking about it recently because one of the first commercials that I location managed was, again, through this contact. So quite often back then, you would assist someone a little bit and they would be quite often juggling several commercials and you would then just be left to look after the shoot on the day, Mm -hmm. knowing nothing. And the first shoot that that happened to me on was a girl that was tied to a railway line with a steam train coming towards her, uh, all shot with a hang crank Mitchell camera. And um, there was a level crossing and there was a van that rushed up to try and help the girl in the nick of time. And and strangely, I haven't filmed at that. Um, it was a preserved railway, obviously, rather than the main, sure. the main British rail network rail line. And uh, I haven't filmed there for... 25 years but actually i'm in contact with them and hopefully going to film with them uh, next year so i was thinking about that first commercial it was for ford vans 
um, shot in black and, black and white with that hand crank style. I was going to say it's, it sounds like the perfect metaphor for you being left alone on your first set is you being tied, <laughs> somebody being tied to the railway tracks. <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, I do a lot of teaching of location managing, and and one of the things I don't know if you know the Wallace and Gromit um, set of films. Uh, I think there's. I think it's the wrong trousers and there's a sort of oh, crazy yes, penguin absolutely. that goes off on a train and Gromit is hastily laying down the track just in front of the train. So he's in a carriage just in front of the train laying down track as it goes. And I always think well, sort of like penguin who's got a gun <laughs> and he's sort of like on a runaway train. It's a bit like the director, you know, just sort of blindly going on and Wallace is dancing around going, it will be fine. It will be fine. So he's the producer, and then um, Gromit, you know, is the grafter, and he's the one that's actually laying the track in front of it, <laughs> keeping it all on track. And no, no one probably notices it, but I think, I think that's quite a good sort of little film that makes it, is how we feel sometimes in the location department. That's a great illustration I haven't heard before because that is exactly what we're doing most of the time. It's you know, putting it all together to keep the camera moving, and it and it starts long before the camera ever shows well, up. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I, genuinely, I think sometimes when a crew say, "Oh, how long have you been on this?" as they in the first week of the shoot, and you sort of say, "Well, since March or something," they they have no comprehension that the location manager has been and the location department have been setting this up for a very long time what did um when you obviously had a limited exposure to film before you got into it by accident you met this location manager and then you get into the business how different was your perception of what the job was from what you were doing when you first got in <laughs> in in all honesty i don't think i'd thought about it at all it was just one of those, it was one of those moments where <laughs> you know i met someone seemed like a good idea and actually, once I got into it, I loved all that curiosity, that detective work that you go finding locations. I don't think I'd actually given filming and film crews much thought at all. I mean, it certainly wasn't an option when you were at school of sort of, you know, um, there are people behind the camera. That That's never really explained to you or certainly wasn't back then. So, I, you know, I loved it. I loved sure. people, which, of course, you know, everyone who does our job loves be, loves meeting strange and interesting and wonderful people along the way and and that sort of that way that you connect very quickly with crews and you have to sort of make things happen um it's quite transient but uh but i enjoy it what when you first started uh, were you doing more of the logistics or were you involved in the creative side of things? Because I know that, uh, you know, we've talked about it so many times with others. It does seem that, and you you hinted at it, most people think it's the logistics is our job, but there's so much more to it than that. Were you dealing primarily with the logistics or were you bringing Barat into the creative role at, at, from the very beginning? From the very beginning, I was really scouting um, and, uh, and, and covering the shoot, but it was very much about scouting, which I think is, Probably more so because I started in commercials. So now I think if you start in TV and drama and film, you know, you mm -hmm. will do a long time probably on the floor uh, as a junior member of the department before you, you move up. And it's, it's quite a, a long mm -hmm. time before you probably end up scouting. Whereas, you know, in 1993, 94, it was literally go and go and find 10 swimming pools that I can film in. Um, to you know, a location manager who'd already been doing it for 15, 20 years at that point was like, right, okay, uh, how do I do that? <laughs> and in those days, you would drive around with the yellow pages. I don't know what the equivalent of a phone directory is in the States, but, you know, it's sort of like a doorstep of a book that's um, 10 inches thick, and you'd go driving yeah. off with two or three of those in the boot of your car and rolls and rolls of film and come back several days later and have to get it all developed and stuck on bits of black card and and then shown to the client and it, but it was just sort of ingenuity and and detective work because no one really told you how you go about finding something it's just go and do it and come back with something so, what was your did you have any interesting experiences those first days of scouting and trying to figure out how to pull this off did you i remember one of the commercials i did i was i was asked for um a sort of old-fashioned mansion block of flats with a staircase where we could get a goat to run down. <laughs> um, I cannot tell you what that commercial was for, but I do remember thinking at the end of it, don't work with goats again. 
<laughs> and funnily enough, there are goats in the script that I'm working on at the moment, and we need to get them to an island that's tidal. And I'm just thinking, yeah, I can just see how this is going to go. You know, if we have to get them on a sort of boat, take them out to an island, this is not going to go to plan. Goats do not do what you want them to do. And the goats, I remember, <laughs> would not run down this staircase at all. So it was probably in the days before you had humane animal handlers. So I'm sure there was someone just shoving the goat from behind in the hope it would run down the stairs. But, <laughs> but yeah, that, that was quite interesting because most rather lovely, beautiful mansion blocks of flats were not particularly welcoming to having a, a stinking goat running down their stairs. So I actually had to find... Uh, that was thinking outside a box of sort of finding... Uh, an empty building that was going to be developed and that had a a beautiful staircase. I can't remember exactly where we, and actually I I can, I can remember it was somewhere, it was an old college near Notting Hill and it had a very beautiful staircase. But every every job's different, as you know. I mean, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. we learn something new on every job, don't we? Uh, Oh, for sure. and, And that's part of the fun, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Every, you know, you have and shifting gears, you know, going from maybe a period piece to a contemporary piece and, you know, trying to look at things slightly differently and, and set aside the things you were trying to avoid that you now can embrace, uh, certainly impact, you know, what you're doing day to day. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've done in recent years has been period, but then last year I spent a um, very different year working again with Armando Inucci on his um, latest project avenue five which is an hbo um drama set in space in sort of 40 years in the future and there were lots of big sets in in mm-hmm. leaveston warner brothers leaveston studios and any of the story that took place back on earth was sort of my domain out on location but of course so we were trying to find things that looked like america in 40 years time there weren't many locations but it was great fun and we ended up actually filming at McLaren headquarters who have an, a wonderful architectural building. You know, it's just stunning. It may be about, it's about 15 or 18 years old now, but it still looks incredibly modern. And and that was a real pleasure to go and do that, which was so different to a lot of the period stuff that I've been doing. Well, that is period in a way though, <laughs> you know, think about it. And <laughs> you're just, it's a future period that you're imagining. So you're, <laughs> yes, uh- but I, you know, I even here we've done, you know, I've worked on shows set in the eighties, um, and that is very much a period of its own. It doesn't have to be, you know, Victorian or Edwardian era to be period. You know, you've got certain considerations that people don't think about. You know, here we've got the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and all these implementations of ramps and things that would not have existed at that time, and suddenly you you move into a building that works perfectly, but then you've got handicap ramps and and accommodations that would not have been there that you've got. To figure out how to to hide or work around to pull off the shot. So there's similar considerations you have in a in an older period film, but you get a contemporary period. You've got things that you've got to consider that maybe you're not thinking of when you first get into the project. Absolutely. I mean, certainly when I'm teaching, it's like I'm just trying to explain to them that anything before about 2000 is period. Now you know people were smoking mm-hmm. inside restaurants. You know, go back. <laughs> people were smoking in aeroplanes and trains which you know yeah. the younger generation right. just look at me as if i'm completely nuts it's like no it, people just smoked everywhere um and little yeah. things like that i mean i don't know whether you've you've had all your parking meters removed but um pretty much anywhere in london now your your parking is done on a text app so there are mm-hmm. no parking meters or you know just small stuff isn't it and yeah, telephone boxes telephone you know. boxes and electric car chargers. Um, so, yep. you know, I've not actually had to try and have them removed yet. Um, but I'm sure the time will come when someone says, can can we just lose that? Because they're now, you know, everywhere, aren't they? Electric yeah. car chargers. Yeah. Are sort of, they're popping up everywhere. So, that you know, the challenges change, don't they? Yes. I'm by here, you know, for example, we've got a bike lanes going in all over Atlanta. And then you add to that a, a new trolley system we didn't have that they, uh, they've they added. And, and you add all these levels of complexity that you didn't have to think about. So the next time you go downtown in Atlanta, you've suddenly got something totally new that you've never had to deal with before. Yeah, but uh, the advances in, you know, visual effects and what we can do now are brilliant. And I did an interview a couple of years ago, and someone was asking if um, you know, the, the 
ease and the quality of visual effects would make our job slightly more redundant. But actually, I think it offers so many more opportunities because often we find the perfect house, but, you know, let's say it needs to be by the sea. There was a film I did a few years ago, My Cousin Rachel, and the, the house is scripted as being near the sea. But, of course, we didn't find the perfect house by the perfect bit of coast. But because of mm-hmm. the magic of CGI, um, we could find the perfect house and we could find the perfect bit of coast and put them together. And, you know, five years ago, even, we all the television aerials we'd have to actually have removed, whereas now, fortunately, you know, that falls into the world of visual effects rather than actually having to have all those things taken down and put back up. Yeah, we were dealing with the same thing with even uh, crowds shooting in the current environment. You know, we we were filming a movie and you had crowd scenes and suddenly you can't have all those people on set anymore. We've got to figure out a way to add the people, which we would have just hired, you know, hundreds of background in the old days. And now we've, we've even incorporated that into the new filming um, you can do in reverse, yeah, adding in people as opposed to just adding in antennas or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Did, do you, how do you think your um, your photography interest as your when, you know as an art photographer? Do you feel like that helped you with presenting locations, or do you feel like you had to think differently about how you photograph things when you're going out scouting for a location? Do you think that was a, a little bit of a help absolutely, to you? Absolutely, I think I think being able to take a good photo um, means that whoever has asked you to go scouting uh, is is pleased with the results that you you capture it you i mean even the simplest things of um getting your verticals vertical and your horizontals horizontal framing it you know all of those sort of simple things you know if you're out scouting and you can produce good well exposed photos then you're going to be asked back um it is different i mean certainly when you're going out scouting you're not going to take a beautiful close-up detail of a you know, a a drain or a small flower or whatever else you might, you know, find curious. But, you know, those sort of things you can still, I can still photograph and put on my Instagram or whatever and still enjoy that aspect of it. But the the art photography side of it isn't so relevant, but the being able to take a decent photo is. Have you, but have you found, I know that I was talking to Mike Fantasia and he mentioned, and I've talked about shooting windows, like stained glass windows in a place. There was no, no stained glass windows in the script, but the windows in this one building we were in were so beautiful that I just couldn't resist taking some photographs of them. And I left them in and they ended up adding a scene or, a, you know, kind of a establishing where they incorporated some shots of the windows because they did like them as well. Mike talked about shooting shooting a doorknob in a location and that sold the location to somebody. Have you had an instance where you took that artsy photo and left it in and it helped sell uh, a location? I, I can't think of a particular incident, but um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, there are occasions where you do try really hard to make it look beautiful or you doing, yeah, you do include other things. There's of course other occasions where um, a location has been scouted and photographed and the director's just glossed over it. And you go yourself to photograph it on a different day in different light, mm-hmm. and the director mm-hmm. never knows that they've seen it twice and chooses it. So it, you know, how you photograph it is definitely important. You know, you touched on a little bit, and one of the things I wanted to make sure we covered when in our conversation was the training program that you do, which I think is really great because you know we do have. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what it's like there, but for a long time, we did not have enough people trained in the job. And so you were kind of on the job training people and, and bringing in people that may not have been quite ready to do the job and trying to get them up to speed. And and uh, they, you know, we've got some people that came out, out on the other side, kind of trial by fire that are very good. But then you feel like maybe somebody else that didn't come through the other side and walked away could have been very good if they'd been given a little more training and you had a little more time to invest in it. Talk a little bit about the training programs that you you've worked on with film is a film focus, I believe, and our film London. And, um, um, yeah, it, it started not long actually after, um, I had my son and I, I did, I carried on working in the film industry pretty much up until I had him and was shooting again, not many months after he was born, but I, I didn't want to work full time, obviously at that time. And Film London were developing a location manager's training course. And I came in to advise on the content 
which was great. You know, it got you really thinking about all aspects of our job. And, you know, the list is pretty endless, as we know, and it changes on every job and you become experts on different things and you solve other problems. And I really enjoyed that. And then the person that they had running the course wasn't particularly knowledgeable about the actual film industry and filming. And and for whatever reason, he parted company and they were halfway through the first year of running it. And so I stepped in and actually we had a really big review of it after the first year. Now that that must be going back to about 2006 or 2007. And we um, really, well, I, I completely took the curriculum apart and changed the structure of it. And so the content was mostly there, but it was just how it was structured. And we ended up structuring it over six months with one weekend a month. So it was aimed at people who were already in the location department and had a year or two of experience behind them. And we got working location managers in to teach them different sections. So so obviously we broke it down into the different parts of our job of sort of you know, um, and even got some actually quite corporate things in. So we we have someone who comes in and teaches communication uh, in, in quite a corporate way, but it, it works because that's not something we do in our industry. So it makes people stop and think. And then we do script breakdowns and scouting and photography, and we look at budgeting and planning it and the legal aspects and health and safety. You know, we look at electrical parts we we put in drones now all those aspects that you know just a part of it and then then managing the shoot and all the logistical um paperwork and so on that comes with that and so th- that sort of really worked because they could carry on working um between each weekend so they were still earning money rather than trying to do it over a sort of three week slightly more indigestible sort of solid bank of lessons mm-hmm. And we got made. I, I was adamant that it had to be working location managers who were current and relevant and knew what they were doing. And we got some of the top locations. Well, we we do. We still we still get the top location managers um, in the UK involved. And each of the students was given again a working location manager as a mentor. So they had a lot of input that you know. Um, but we don't run the course every year. Uh, I, you know, I I don't have the capacity to run it every year because I'm I tend to go off and work, and it's quite and it's quite a lot of planning <laughs> and time to keep it running. Um, but we've we've run it probably sure. six times now, um, and we have sort of eighteen to twenty students each year. But we have the same problem that you have, Dodd that there are not enough trained people coming through. And I'm passionate about not throwing people in Mm -hmm. and expecting them to sink or swim. I think that's very bad for their mental health. I think it's bad for our, our craft because I think they make mistakes and they, because they don't have the knowledge and the skills. And I think one of the things, because we often do our job very well and nobody knows what we do, people think our job is simpler than it is. And it is incredibly complex. It's sort of, I often say that we're sort of a mm-hmm. bit like ninja Cinderella's, you know, we just sort of come in and fix everything invisibly and do all the work and then, then dive <laughs> out again. And it's, it, and I would love to say that we can train everyone who's coming through and give them that knowledge so that they don't jump up too early. But we've been so busy over here that people are stepping up um, before and they're learning on the job, which, you know, was how I learnt. And, you know, there was no formal training, sure. but I know that um, my my location babies, as they are known, um, you know, they do stay ALMing for longer than I think people who haven't necessarily been through the course, probably because they realize how complex it is. So they tend not to step up too quickly. They spend a long time, sort of four or five years at the ALM stage consolidating Mm -hmm. their knowledge what was great this year i mean this year has been incredibly challenging for everyone but it's really good we managed to keep the course sort of running in a in a different way throughout lockdown so over the three or four months of lockdown we had 11s every tuesday on zoom 
and brought in a whole wealth of experts, other location managers to talk about their experiences. So we we brought um, a lawyer in to talk about contracts. We brought a company in to talk about greening the industry. We talked we talked about sort of specific shooting on the move and and traffic control and things like that. So they had actually this this long period of meeting a whole variety of people that we probably wouldn't normally have time to cover in the course. And then towards the end of the course, we give them a bit of a more meaty um, assignment to do. And we give them a little fictitious script, which has every sort of possible thing that you could probably not want in the same script. So, you know, one of the scripts has runaway horses, it has lightning, it has rain. It has someone falling down the stairs and going on fire. It has guns. It has, um, you know, piles of food and flickering candles and huge crowd scenes and and all of those sort of things. Um, and another of the scripts has, you know, aliens and futuristic police on bikes and drones and a slightly sort of broken, dysfunctional society. So we cram these all into a sort of, a two-page script and then set them off to find a location and literally think of every aspect, budget it, you know, do the plans, do the movement orders, do the health and safety risk assessments, cost up everything they would need to make that script work. And that's quite that's quite involved and they need to set aside quite a lot of time. And then again, you know, um, myself and another location manager work through that to sort of hopefully hopefully they have have it all covered and we have taught them properly yeah i I had an experience where i I inherited Um, a show another location manager left and i was brought in to take over and start talking we i don't know i i make this assumption sometimes and find out not everybody is structured the same way but on a lot of shows we have assistant managers and then we have a key assistant manager or two and then a location manager or supervising location manager and the keys are kind of maybe junior location managers, really. I mean, they're, the assistants are, it's it's kind of a weird intermediate step. And I had two keys, and I start talking about some of the things we need. It was an episodic, and I'm saying, well, you know, you should probably reach out to such and such department at this government agency. And they're like, okay, how do I do that? And I realized <laughs> they hadn't even managed at any level. They were, they were PAs that got bumped up by this person. And I was sitting there for a minute just thinking, what? How how nervous can this person be? You were just handed a role you have zero experience working in. You've just been a set PA, and suddenly you're solving the problems that we do deal with every day. And I had to take a deep breath, slow down, and help realize. You know, I, I don't have, to, I don't want to replace this person. I see the potential in them, and I want to bring them along. But yet, I've got a show to run that is incredibly demanding because we've got 10 days to find locations, clear locations, scout locations, and go to work. And uh, I just was sitting there like, what can this person be feeling right now being handed this responsibility without any experience doing it? And I, you know, hearing about your program is like, gosh, I wish we had something like that that they could have gotten involved in on the weekend <laughs> so they could have been training up a little bit before they just got dumped into this I think role. even t- um, two-day courses, and, we, and we've run a lot of two-day courses just to give people a slight overview of what's what's our, involved in our department because – um mm-hmm. you know i think i think half of them are quite happy to accept that responsibility that you were talking about because they're not aware that actually it should be a lot more complicated than it first seems um uh, sure and and you know two day courses really work in in giving them a sort of opening their eyes to how complex it is right yeah, I just think they had no idea what they were going to be asked to do, you know, they're, and you just tell them and they're like, well, how did you know that? And I'm like, well, I've been doing this for a minute, you know, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and I, you know, and on you, our longer course, the six month one, you know, they benefit so much because, you know, they need so many um, experienced location managers as tutors. And then, you know, they all have their own mentor and they meet other people's mentors. And these are, you know, the top location managers in film and TV in the country. and it's really good for them to gain that experience and and hear hear the hear the stories you know the war the war stories that, that when it went wrong you know um right and we've all got those what's the worst <laughs> and, story you have where something went totally wrong and yet you managed to become the ninja cinderella that you mentioned earlier and solve that problem 
Um, do you know what? I think it's a bit like childbirth. I think once you've done it, you sort of forget about <laughs> it. But otherwise, you can never do it again. Um, you know, uh, there there have been a, a couple. I mean, they're not total disasters, but and you know, I know some stories that uh, have gone very wrong, and and you're left there. But you know, there are there are places where the people that I signed the contract with weren't the right people. Mm-hmm. Certainly, there was there was a film we did a few years ago, Overlord, and we were filming in a railway tunnel, and I had a sign. It, it was a, a disused railway tunnel, so there was no train track in it and we'd been there for six weeks with the art department construction prepping it we had a signed contract from the owners and the day before the main unit moved in i i had a call on the radio saying there was a man in a a high-vis um jacket who was measuring up the front of the tunnel for something and i was like oh um nobody told me he was coming down so i went down to meet him and discovered that he was down there at the request of the owners for a once a year inspection and the owners weren't the people that I'd signed the contract with. Oh goodness. Um so that all got quite legal and um obviously we were dealing with American studio. So they were working at the opposite hours of the twenty four hours to us to right. try and get answers. And that went back and forth for a bit and w- I mean we did solve it, but it was one of those wow, I've been doing this for more than 20 years and I didn't see that coming. Um, and I think the the original people that had signed the contract did genuinely believe they they owned it, but in fact they only owned the trackway either side of the tunnel, not the actual tunnel. Anyway, that was one of them. Um, a, a good one was um, filming in the House of Commons, which uh, we took Suffragette into the House of Commons. You were the first to uh, film in there, weren't you? Uh, commercially, yes. I mean, obviously, they have, sure. uh, uh, you know, televised visits and state openings and things like that. Um, but we were the first commercial film to to go in there, and I think there was a bit of serendipity. The right people were in the right place. I mean, it took six months of of nurturing that relationship, and you know, they could organise state visits from Obama and other heads of state and royalty and so on, but. A film crew is all a little bit more feral, isn't it? It's, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, you know the, the junior runners are used to just going off and fixing things by themselves. And I think this made Parliament really quite nervous because we, it is like herding cats, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know? and, and because we're used to solving things there and then and not waiting, we all just get on and do things. And that's not how somewhere like the the House of Commons Parliament runs. You know, the, there are protocols and you have to do things their way. And we did four days of rioting suffragettes and horses and all sorts of things. And it, it was amazing. And I had to pinch myself and I was walking through sort of dark courtyards in the back of Parliament. That most people don't go at the end of a shoot day with, with the moon over Big Ben thinking, we pulled that off. We've actually done it. And um, but they didn't sign the contract till the day before the shoot. Oh, so boy. that was always. <laughs> I mean, one of it was they couldn't quite decide who should sign our contract. I mean, we'd spent weeks discussing the contract and you know changing it and minute changes and things. But uh, I ended up, yeah, signing it on the Friday afternoon, the day before we started shooting. It was a little bit close to comfort. Do you find that the relationship you have to establish with the production designer is critical to your success as a location manager, or is or is it the producers you feel that you have to keep happier in those early creative stages of a production? Well, it's both, really, isn't it? Because we've got a responsibility to, to both, to the creative side and the logistics, which is what I think makes our job really, really interesting, because it's quite an unusual combination skill set the logistics Mm -hmm. and the creative i mean obviously working with a designer who is collaborative and interested in what we can bring to the table is a much more enjoyable experience but equally we do have to have that slight sense of responsibility that we're not presenting the most gorgeous the most aesthetic the most beautiful location that is absolutely going to cripple the budget you know that would not (laughs) get us um employed again so Having having both those hats on 
is mm-hmm. a challenge. And and that's one of the challenges that I love because, you know, I, I referred earlier to this tidal island, which has got nothing more than a shack on it. And we want to shoot on it and we want to take some goats out to it. And my designer, who I've worked with a couple of times before, walked away from one day on, on a recce there and said, I think this is my favourite location ever. Um, and she's been, you know, in the industry for 25 years as well. And I just thought, wow, you know, she's done a lot of things. I've got to pull this off. You know, if mm-hmm. she's saying this to me, then this really, really matters. And I want to pull it off. And, you know, we are still working on the logistics of how we get to the island. And quite frankly, once we're on the island, we're there for the day. And then we have we have to think about the um, dull but important things like toilets. We, mm-hmm. we might only go over with a reduced crew, but I, I start worrying about how we get the goats there and they've got hooves. And if we've got a, a rib, are the hooves going to puncture the, the rubber dinghy, the rib? And just, you know, your mind runs away with sort of all the problems of, well, quite, what are we going to do about toilets? What are we going to do with these goats? And what if the goats run away and run into the sea? <laughs> Any number of things could go wrong with this. But, you know, so working with a designer who's collaborative is great, but it's it's also fantastic when you've got a really collaborative sort of line producer or producer who understands those um, that sort of clash sometimes of of budget versus aesthetic. And if you can have those open conversations. And I do, I really think working across the board together and being very upfront and open makes for a much nicer job. I mean, one of the wonderful things about Copperfield was it really, really felt like we were all in it together and every HOD was keen to work through the problems themselves. I mean, Copperfield was was great because um, the designer really, really was interested in what I brought to the table. And Amando really wanted to move slightly away from um, visual effects and do a lot of the effects in the camera. So it meant our DP and our designer worked very closely together to work out how to do some of these effects and make it very theatrical, but in camera. So there, there were a lot of challenges on that. That was another film that was a lot about tides and boats. Um, <laughs> that's the uh oh, that is a little bit of a uh, a war story we had we had a little harbor in um david copperfield that was it had a, a sort of fixed lock gate so uh, the the tide never went in and out it was just you know locked in and those gates hadn't been taken out for about 10 years but we needed to take them out to get the boats in and we needed to make sure that that was at one of the highest tides which we did, but the gates were taken out and serviced and they were only brought back a couple of days before we filmed and they put them in and they worked beautifully and the water stayed in the harbour and that was all very lovely and we were all quite pleased. But then they, so that was the test to see if the gates fitted after their refurbishment. And then they took the gates out. Now this had to be done by a crane. These were, the gates had to be pulled out by a crane. And so they took them out again so that we could get the boats in at the high tide. And when they put the gates back in for the second time, they started leaking. So um, if you imagine a a dock of water and it's got these lock gates, there's basically panels that slot in and and it started leaking. And I got a text um, at midnight, which I should know better than to look at texts at midnight. I got a text. Um, <laughs> we all should, from yeah. The expert at at the dock saying it's not looking good. It's still leaking. Well, of course, at that point you're never going to go back to sleep because you you don't know what you're going to be walking into the next morning. Um, and so you know, after a couple of hours of not sleeping, I thought, well, I might as well drive over. And we had to hire one of the biggest pumps possible from the environment agency and pump water from one area to another. And we, I think we only lost a few inches of water over the shooting day, but uh, yeah, that was interesting. And it was one of those things that of course, you know, nobody, the designer, the producers didn't really know what was going on in the background and, and we didn't really want them to share the stress, but (laughs) 
it's hard not to bring them in sometimes because you just want to pass some of that stress <laughs> off. But yeah, it's important not to at times as well. Yeah, it's deciding when to share it, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the tricky balance. Do you have a specific collaboration with a designer? Like, have you have you worked with some of these people multiple times and there's one you really get excited to hear you get that call from? Or or have most of them been one-offs? Because you know, we we talk about this being like a war at times where you go off to war with a group and you finish it and you have these, you look back on it really fondly and you kind of miss those people after you're done, <laughs> even though you didn't at the time. It's and then you made against a brick wall, isn't it? When right. It stops, it's <laughs> right. wonderful. Yeah. yeah the, um, no, several of the designers I've worked with um, uh, multiple times and, you know, those are, those are the ones that are rewarding. Um, um, the, there's a TV director um, that I worked with for several years, and that that was very creative for me because he would bring me on to do some very early scouting long before we were in production, and I would do three or four weeks. And 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 talking about you, you were saying about the stained glass window, and you know, I would find stuff that would work their way into the script, and and that was I worked, well, you know, five or no more than that six or seven times with this director over 10 years. And that, that was very collaborative. Um, but yes, I, I love working with designers that enjoy the process, the detective mm -hmm. bit that, you know, that we do. Yeah, it's fun when they, you know, I, I was doing something and I took a black and white shot once of something for myself really. And I accidentally left it in the files that I uploaded and, <laughs> but it turned, was that an accidentally on purpose? No, it was actually totally accidental, <laughs> but it, but it really, it, I thought of it later and they, and she, I, the director actually came to me later and said, do more of that because that helped me get a better feel for a, a lighting aspect of that window or where it was positioned because the contrast was such, it was different than the color photograph. And it made me think of a shot differently that I did, went on to talk to the cinematographer about. And, you know, it's really nice when something that you've done Done, even if it is accidental, can have that creative impact where you really feel like you you were collaborating more than just you know following through on a task of going and finding a location. Yeah, I mean, most of I mean, you probably see from from my um, resume that um, most of what I do is independent films or drama, and I I find that it's more creative and that I can have more input and that. You know, the, the director I'm working with at the moment, you know, we, we will share not just photos, but I share interesting articles that I find from the historical aspect. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just something fell into my in inbox the other day or my news feed about um, old songs that the barge people who used to sail these, these beautiful old sailing barges, they used to sing. And it was, you know, it's nothing to do with um, locations, really. But I have. I'm enjoying that relationship and that um, bio, our director, is is just so interested in every aspect of it. And also, you know, we can meet really interesting people. Now, that person itself might not be helping me with the location in the end, but they might have some really interesting knowledge. Mm -hmm. And again, on the show that I'm doing at the moment, the director and designer are so interested in all those tiny historical details that being able to put interesting people in touch with them. So that helps to add to their, their creative um, vision and research. Then, you know, if I can help make those connections, then I'm definitely adding something quite important to it. Absolutely. And, you know, this is the, this is the sort of thing I love messing around with boats and horses and trains and, you know, learning all these, these things about, you know, life was like 130 years ago on the the edge of the world and in that sort of barge community i mean you know sometimes it's it's something quite unexpected that you you think is going to be easy and then um it's quite hard to find and sort of bizarrely on on a couple of films it's been a, a church and you know you'd think britain is absolutely stuffed full of churches we're <laughs> particularly looking for an isolated pre-victorian one and you know we're up to nearly 100 churches that we've scouted um and you know you'll find one that has the most amazing interior but actually you can't get a good shot of the exterior because you know there are lots of trees mm -hmm. surrounding it or you can 
a really beautiful one or it's too far away. I mean, always the the sort of distance that you can travel from base is a challenge. And, you know, if only we could take that out of the equation, we could put together an, an even more stunning film. That's part of what we do, isn't it? To try and find those perfect locations within whatever our travel distance is from base. It is, yeah. And when you get a script, you know, what, what gets you fired up when you read a script? Is there something you'll hit a moment in the script and you'll go, okay, I really am excited about this project that you feel is particularly passionate about it? You know, I've got projects that come to me periodically and you end up doing it and it really, you look back on it and it was really more about, okay, I did my job because I was hired to do my job, but it wasn't something that I felt particularly rewarded by. And I did a good job for them, but it wasn't as exciting as something else I really could, you know, sink my teeth into and get excited about. Is there a type of script or something in a script you see that you go, this is something I can really have some fun with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are some some scripts which are much more appealing. I mean, there's certainly a couple that I've read in the last couple of years that I know I could do and I could do probably perfectly well, but they're just not necessarily me right now. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And certainly, the one the one that I'm doing at the moment um, has everything that makes me excited and and actually took me to an area of England that I didn't know particularly well. And know incredibly well now. You know, I'm just scouting <laughs> it before lockdown. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of big cinematic exteriors. So, uh, you know, just as lockdown lifted, I could go back out and scout it. And I didn't have to do a huge amount of door knocking at that stage. Um, so that it was those sort of wide open landscapes that were so good. Um, and that, that sort of thing I love, absolutely love, because, you know, each each frame that I can go and photograph and scout is like, you know, a beautiful photo and, and bringing that back and introducing the director and designer to somewhere new and exciting is also really satisfying. What do you think when you're teaching your class, is there a specific skill set that you feel is critical to being really good as a location manager or perfect locations person that is hard to, to teach (laughs) <laughs> that people just have to uh, kind of already have in their quiver when they come to the table to get the, do this job? Or do you feel like most of the skills can be taught? Um, a lot of them can be taught. Um, I think the, the one, the, there is a certain intuition. There's something that we call nous. I've no idea if it translates, if nous is something that exists in the, <laughs> in the American vocabulary. But it's, it's that... Um, sort of intuition it's common sense it's mm. um mm-hmm. uh, my partner's very helpfully looking it up i think it's <laughs> um but it is just it's just um according to google it's common sense practical intelligence um it also says it's a, a philosophy of the mind or the intellect it, it is the bit that you can't teach it is that instinct um i think also having hunger and curiosity uh, beyond just ticking a box is essential to be a good location manager or a good scout and that can't necessarily be taught so there is an element that the best uh, assistants that go on to be the best location managers have that is part of their dna i think um you know you can teach the legal stuff. You can teach photography. You might not be able to teach someone to be the best photographer, but you can certainly teach them to take better photos. Um, you can teach them, you can give them a list of all the things that you need to think about before you start shooting. But I think the ones that elevate above that are the ones that have an artistic curiosity and interest in in every aspect of what you're researching and photographing and scouting and then you know obviously the logistics of putting it together this has been locations on two the podcast taking you around the world and behind the scenes with location managers working in all aspects of the entertainment industry locations on two is brought to you by the location managers guild international visit them online at locationmanagers.org 
For more episodes of Locations on Two, you can visit us online at locationson2.com or look anywhere you get your other favorite podcasts. This is Dodd Vickers, your host for Locations on Two, and I can be found at doddvickers.com. Until next time, I'm switching back to Channel One.